Welcome back to Girls Next Level, everybody. What are you doing this week, Bridget? Well, first of all, I'm celebrating because we just hit 16 million downloads. Oh, that's amazing. I cannot believe it. Thanks, you guys. We love you. Yeah, thank you so much. It's amazing. Um, This week, let's see here. It's a pretty chill week for me. I might go see my friend do her show. What kind of show? Like a live, like a stage show, oh, like a one man show. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm taking the kids to Vegas this week. I have all kinds of activities planned. We're doing like the mermaid swim. They have this casino called the Silverton and they have this giant like aquarium in there and the kids will put on mermaid tails and swim with the fish. Yes, I know this. And did you just watch the uh, mermaid documentary on Netflix? I haven't seen it yet. Oh my gosh, because I have it in my slumber party notes to talk to you about because I watched it. Well, Juliana, a playmate that you've seen on the show, she's like in season four and stuff. She's now a full-time mermaid. Get out of town! Yes! No, she's a mermaid. I did not know this. She, like, works kids' birthday parties and does all kinds of other things. She has a whole, like, persona. It's amazing. That's incredible. (laughs) Yeah. So it's going to be a fun week. Yeah, definitely. And I can't believe, too, that we only have two more episodes left of this season. I know. It's weird. It it went by fast for us. Like, I know you guys are being like, damn, it's taking you guys so long to get through the episodes. But for us, it felt like it went really fast. Like, I can't believe we've almost been doing this podcast for a year. Me neither. And I, I do see some people complaining that we take too long on the episodes and stuff. But also, I feel like we have to because I look back on the way we do it now versus the way we did it right at the beginning. And I'm almost like, I need to go back and like rehash those first episodes because I feel like I'm even better at going through and breaking it down now. Well, it takes a minute just to like get back in that time space and remember everything. Yeah. I like doing it better this way. But anyway, like we love doing this journey with you guys and we love that you guys are having fun with us. And I just can't believe we've been doing this for almost a year. Me neither. It's nuts. You know what I thought was weird about this episode we're going to talk about? And uh, I mean, obviously, I'm only I've only watched the episodes up to this episode, Mm -hmm. so I haven't watched all the rest of them yet. But so far, this is the first one that I think does like three separate storylines for each of us. Yeah, it's what Kevin used to call a Frankenstein episode. Yeah, he used to call it a Frankenstein episode when he would have three completely separate storylines and he'd have to mash them together. I mean, this one, not as much as future Frankenstein episodes because my plot line is only the cold open. Right. But, I mean, we know they hate to feature me at this point, so it's uh, not. But can I address the title of this episode clueless. for a minute? No, not even that. The, oh. I'm, I'm going to sorry. I'm going to call this um, episode of the podcast why we hated each other. And hate is a strong word. I wouldn't say we hated each other, but I do feel like the audience. Well, I feel like it's kind of split down the middle. I feel like the people who watched Girls Next Door either thought that we were all three the best of friends and they can't figure out why we're not all three the best of friends now and they think that's a shame. Or there's the other half of the audience that thinks we hated each other. And when I say we hated each other, I don't mean you and I. Like, I don't think anybody ever doubted our friendship. But like Kendra's the common denominator that like people think we hate each other or that I hate her or that she hates me or something like that. And hate's a strong word. I wouldn't say we hate each other, but I wanted to call the episode that because I think that's what a lot of people think. And I will say that um, the relationship between the three of us like changed over the four years that we all lived at the mansion together. And there were definite ups and downs. There were a lot of times for the most part, I felt like we got along. There were definitely flare ups along the way. But I feel like even when we had flare ups, I feel like it's not for the reasons people would think. I think they feel like we were fighting over Hef. And that's definitely not true. Oh, you think they think that? I I think they think that like I was super jealous because I thought people were like encroaching on Hef and stuff or that we were fighting over Hef or like fighting for his attention. And I think that's what Hef would like you to think. And I think that's what Kevin would like people to think maybe. But it's definitely not true. Like, I didn't ever feel like you or Kendra were trying to get any more out of Hef or, like, more time with Hef or, like, wanted my spot. Like, I was very aware of that. Like, that was never part of the conflict. Right. Or sometimes I think people feel like 
we didn't like Kendra because she was late or because her room was messy or like some really dumb reason that we did not care about. Or because she was different from us or something. But those are, that's the reason I liked her so much. I always felt that like that was a plus too. Like when we were still living with the mean girls and I kind of got the feeling that Hef was looking for somebody new. I was like, okay, yeah, it would be great to have somebody new if that meant we could get rid of the other people. And I started to kind of visualize like what would an ideal third person be like and one of the things I had on my list was somebody who had different interests than us because I do like I love the fact that we share common interests but I do think we have a lot of different interests too and we're two very separate people I feel like even on the show it comes off I thought I felt like it might feel a little smothering if like somebody else moved in and they were like also a Disney adult who wanted to do the same things and wanted to watch all the same old movies like that would have driven me up a fucking wall so I loved it that she was like into sports and had other things to talk about that made we didn't know about Mm -hmm. you know what I mean like I thought that was like a fun new energy for the group but we'll get into the reasons why there were actual flare-ups and and conflict as we get into this episode because this is the first episode in season one where I don't think you can necessarily see it because the conflict was going on beneath the surface in fact I didn't even know what the real conflict was until you and I were discussing this episode as we were re-watching it just now. And I'll get into what I thought it was or what I was aware of as yeah. we go through this episode. But y'all are going to find out the yeah. real reasons, at least from our perspective. I have it in my notes. Buckle up because this has a lot of behind the scenes drama that people didn't even know existed for sure I don't think they knew existed anyway and well, I didn't even know the full story like even when I did my YouTube recap I knew that something had happened but I made an assumption and attributed it to something different yeah and it's the first time I'm going to talk about it publicly too so that's yeah kind of scary for me yeah I know what you mean <laughs> this episode aired in November 27th 2005 and it's called Clueless. It's all about Bridget's murder mystery birthday party. And we know from last week that the number one song in the US was Run It by Chris Brown. In the UK, it was Hung Up by Madonna. And Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire is still the number one movie. The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown was one of the best selling books. And the wheels kind of come off in this episode. And I'm not talking about Hef's Mercedes that I was learning how to drive. You know what's interesting, though, that I feel like I need to point out before we even get into it is the wheels do kind of come off the bus in this episode, but episodes that already aired that actually didn't happen till after this, Mm -hmm. but they're out of order in the show, so it looks like it already happened. Yeah, because your birthday was one of the earliest things we shot in the second half of season one, because your birthday is late September, Yeah, and then when we went to New York and Chicago, that was all in October when the November issue was coming out, so a lot of the things you've been watching happened before this episode. Yeah, so I have to say that at some point we recover from all of this, but that takes a struggle. Yeah, and I feel like that um, you're the one holding it up. Like, you're the one who's bouncing back and being like, okay, I'm just going to shove this under the rug and I'm going to be supportive and I'm going to be there for Kendra when we're struggling doing press in New York. Yes. Okay, so this first opening scene, it starts out on Hef's car. So Hef had this amazing 1959 Mercedes 300 SL. It was a gorgeous, white, classic car. Bridget, how much do you think a car like that would go for today? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. Let me see. Maybe half a million. Double that. Really? Yeah, it's a million dollar car. (gasps) And he let me learn how to drive a stick on it. Right. Which is insanity. Do you know where they kept that car usually? Because it wasn't just like sitting out at the mansion. I feel like they had it in storage somewhere. Could it have been at the Mapleton house? It's possible. I think that's where it was. That could be. So Hef is showing you the car and he says, what you're looking at here is part of my reinvention in 1959 when I became Mr. Playboy. Isn't that funny to you? When I became Mr. Playboy, like he's a cartoon character and it's getting back to Hef reminds me of Kylie Jenner. Like I swear <laughs> to God, he's the first lifestyle influencer and like he was very 
careful about his image and like wanted to craft this like really aspirational image like this is my car I have the best car this is my house I have the unique best mansion this is my plane things like that and then he has like a character for it Mr. Playboy (laughs) I mean it is really interesting that you just decide one day that you're gonna like become this thing and, Mm -hmm. and you make a list of like what you need to do to become that thing and then you do it and then you do become that thing like I feel like wow that's the secret right there Matt talk about manifestation it's so interesting and did you think it was funny when it shows that clip of him it was like an early 60s documentary somebody made on him it was black and white and he's driving around in the car and in the voiceover from back then he's saying I guess I'm the most successful man I know yeah (laughs) I have it written down here because first of all I wanted to say this is the first time I've ever seen Hef driving a car that is true this clip of him and it's I thought it was filmed very film noir-ish which I feel like he would love yeah it looked that way for sure it was a documentary that aired in Canada for something and it was called The Most well, it looked like it was about to be like some true crime drama. It does look movie. like that. It <laughs> like, does. Like he's a detective. And yeah. He's like, so there I was on the streets. A and <laughs> crime. But he's, he says, my name is Hugh Hefner. I'm 35 years of age and I'm the editor and publisher of Playboy magazine. I guess I'm the most successful person I know. Am I happy? I wouldn't trade it for anyone else in the world. Is that an odd thing to say? Like, even if you are the most successful person you know, does that sound kind of conceited? <laughs> totally. And totally like leaning into just like the mid-century American capitalist definition of successful. Because who's to say that he doesn't know somebody who's a lot fucking happier? Yeah, that's Or fulfilled true. in other ways. That's totally true. In an interview, um, you say, Hef has a hot car that he doesn't drive anymore, and it screams, Holly, drive this. <laughs> oh my God, it really did. And I have to say, I wasn't learning to drive a stick shift cold on this car because Audra was kind enough to let me drive her stick shift BMW all around the streets of Beverly Hills like a lunatic so I had some experience yeah oh that's good that's yeah and I thought as I was watching this I'm like this is a perfect example of how back in the early 2000s you could do a show just about a lifestyle you don't really have to have much plot or drama because who would ever do a scene about driving a stick shift but I shit you not I would have the Kardashians on like the latest episode recently and there's a whole scene where Kendall teaches Kylie how to drive a stick shift oh and in commentary you talk about how rare it is in LA to see a hot vintage car like there's so many nice cars in LA like so everybody's got a nice car in LA practically but to see a vintage yeah that's true like I love things that are very unique and I love vintage things and Like for me, the thing like some people want the thing that's the most expensive or the most whatever. To me, that's not really important. I want the thing that's like the most unique. Well, and in commentary, I talk about how good you look in the car and Kendra just stays completely silent. That's another thing about this episode, too, is I feel like for the most part in commentary and we're recording this commentary for season one all in one day. It's one continuous sit down session in the sound booth. And I felt like we're all pretty supportive of each other in the commentary up to this point, which is odd because there's no reason like attitude should have shifted that day during commentary. I feel like maybe she was triggered by this episode for some reason. Yeah. Well, I think so. Yeah. We're going to get into it. I will say Hef is funny in this scene. Yeah. I felt like he was making funny little comments and stuff. <laughs> I, I was curious, have you always enjoyed classic cars? I always wanted a classic car. I Even when I first moved into the mansion, I was kind of thinking about like, oh, if I got a car like the other girls, what would I get? And what I wanted was either what I have now, which is a 1960 Corvette, or I wanted like a late 70s Corvette Stingray, like the one Dirk Diggler has in Boogie Nights. Yeah. Uh, like that was what I wanted. <laughs> What is it about classic cars that you like? Well, I love vintage things with almost anything. Yeah. I love that they're unique and they turn heads and there's just something special and they require like that little extra bit of effort and care and curation. And I just love all that shit. You know what's funny is my ex had a classic car Mm -hmm. and when we did take it out, it's like there's this camaraderie when you're driving it that people have to wave to you. Yes, especially other people in classic cars. Oh, That's you, a thing. Oh, if you have another classic car that passes by, like it's a whole thing. Like, yeah. It's almost like a bow to each other kind yeah. of thing. But like there's this 
thing that happens when you're in one that people like really respect or something. And it's it's a whole culture that I knew nothing about until that. Yeah, it's so funny. And just even starting a classic car is a whole ordeal. Oh, like I was joking on Twitter once that I thought the most unrealistic part of The Handmaid's Tale was there's a scene where she meets up with her daughter in a house that looks like it's like a seasonal home that's like closed down for the winter. Everything's covered in tarps and, you know, there's nobody in the house and it's snowing and then she wants to escape so she like goes to the garage whips the cover off of this classic car starts it right away and zooms out of there and I'm like that is the most unrealistic fucking thing I've ever seen like a classic car never starts like that like I don't care what good shape it's in you have to like sit there and like pray um (laughs) I learned how to drive a stick shift. Well, that was the first car I drove. We had this old beat up pickup truck out on like my parents' ranch, and Mm -hmm. it was like um, called Three on the Tree. Like it was a column thing. That's how I learned to drive. That's the craziest one (laughs) for sure. So, like, I don't drive stick by choice. Like, Mm -hmm. I just don't. But I feel like if I had to in a pinch, I mean, it'd probably stall out a couple hundred times, but I could do it if I had to. For sure. Sure. Anyway, then Hef tells you that he's somewhat worried. <laughs> the car has four speed shift. And he says, does your car shift at all? Yeah. And I'm like, no. <laughs> You're like, no, it's automatic. And he was like, oh, boy. I don't think he could have really been worried, though, because I really think he would never have let me drive it if he actually thought I was going to fuck it up. Yeah, well, I think he's like, well, Hank will be with you. Yeah, so. <laughs> for sure. Hank was so nice and such a good sport. Yeah, but then Hef offers to go around with you. He's like, well, I'll just sit in here while you go around the driveway a few times, which I thought was weird. Yeah, he's usually not that adventurous. No. (laughs) And then then he changes his mind and he says, no, maybe, Hank, you ought to go with her. Yeah, for sure. (laughs) Well, I think he hadn't driven in so long that if I had had a problem with that car, he would not have had a solution. Oh, I don't think so either. (laughs) He would have been like, what? I think you're (laughs) totally right. That's thinking back to another lifetime. But you seem to get the hang of it super fast. Yeah, because I'd have been driving Audras. It was just the difference of, you know, getting the feel of that different car. Yeah. So I was up in the office, so I'm seeing this Uh transpire and take place. So I come down, and you're like, hop in. And so we, I jump in, and everything was going great. And we go around the mansion block, Mm -hmm. and then we come up to that, the gate to that Stupid yeah, hill. <laughs> the super steep driveway. Yeah. And that's a thing with any car that's going really low. I had that with my Corvette too. You just had to be really careful with that. And then it gets to the point where I'm like at such an angle that the back is like touching the ground. And it's exaggerated on the show. Like the sound it makes, you couldn't have captured that sound without a boom up in it. Like the way they make it so fucking loud. It was so loud. But it was like concerning at the time. And they cut to this look on your face that's so funny. <laughs> You just look so concerned. Well, I do have to say it's not entirely your fault either. Yes, it's a steep driveway and you're coming from a turn on Mm -hmm. it. But also the gate is closed. So we have to give it a beat for the gate to open. Like, I don't know that they just had it wide open waiting for us to come around the corner. No. Yeah. You have to time it out just right. (laughs) Yeah. So if we had to stall at all, that's when the car is going to roll backwards. And every car like that does that. They roll Mm -hmm. backwards. That's why, like, if you're ever on a hill and there's, like, a uh, not automatic car yeah. in front of you, you want to give them their space. Oh, a hundred percent. going to roll back at you. So I get out to look at the car, and I'm wearing my Pamela Anderson shoes. She had a shoe line back then, and she had these vegan shoes that were, like, these plastic slide heels with a star on them. And I thought they were so cute. I wish I still had them. That's funny. They I didn't even cute. notice. Yeah. Well, I didn't remember, but I say in commentary that I ran back up the driveway and went and got Hank to come down because all of a sudden it just shows like Hank is yeah. there. Yeah. He's so helpful. And even watching this back, just seeing the bottom of that car on the ground, it is cringe to me. Like, oh, I'm like, no. A hundred percent. Like I watch that and it's just like your heart drops. It's like you feel it all over again. That sinking feeling like, oh my God. Yeah. And then it shows me driving back up and then driving through that tunnel at the mansion. And we probably don't need to tell you guys this. It's probably obvious, but the crash noise they make is not real. It's like a special effect. Yeah. But and they they vibrate the whole screen to make it look like everything just came crumbling down. So how did you get the idea to have a murder mystery birthday party for your birthday? 
oh, it's something I'd always wanted to have. Mm-hmm. Like, first of all, obviously, I've loved Scooby-Doo since I was little. I loved the Clue game since I yeah. was really little. And I had gone to, like, a, a murder mystery, like, something you buy tickets for at, uh-huh. like, a local place before. And it was okay, but I just saw ways you could do it better. And especially mm-hmm. if it was all your family and friends and yeah. not strangers and stuff. And something I'd always, always wanted to do. But you need, like, a good spot to do it. Yeah, and a venue. Soon, yeah, and when I moved into the mansion, I... I always thought this is the perfect spot for a murder mystery party. But as we've talked about before, birthdays were never like big events. It was like, Mm -hmm. let's go to dinner and come back and have cake and champagne. It was never like some big like, let's throw a party. What do you guys want to do until we started doing the show? Yeah, or even like right before when you did my Winter Wonderland party. That's true. And then I did the sex toy party, which I wanted to be a roller disco party on the, like a Barbie roller skating party on the tennis court, but we couldn't do because every year they have that tennis tournament on your right. birthday, which features prominently in this episode. And I think it's odd looking back because if I wanted to do that, why didn't we just do it the weekend before? Because like, I know that's not your actual birthday, but especially in the early 2000s, it wasn't unusual to ha- for girls to be like, birthday month. I mean, Hef had a fucking birthday month for <laughs> sure. Had birthday years. Yeah. Well, um, I don't think Hef was keen on that. Like he was, I feel like he was like, no, it's not our birthday. Yeah, that makes sense. I feel like he was sort of grumpy about that, like sticking to it. Although, um, you also can't mess with his schedule. So birthdays have to fall on a day that we're not already doing something else. Yeah, totally. But I don't think he was like cool with doing it a full week before, or we definitely would have done that, I think. Yeah. Because I'm also not somebody who's like, oh, it's my birthday and we have to do something today. Yeah. Like, I'm like fine if somebody wants to have dinner with me the next week or the week before or like, Mm -hmm. you know, like we're going to, yeah, it's my birthday today but we're leaving in three days to go you know on a staycation somewhere or something yeah you know, I'm like, not particular either as long as it gets done yeah I don't I just don't really care that much so it uh, it doesn't bother me that it wouldn't have bothered me if we did it beforehand but I th- I feel like Hef was a real stickler on that for sure unless it was his birthday then the birthday could last all month but <laughs> Yeah. So it shows out, it starts out with somebody mowing the lawn and Kendra in an interview says, today is such a busy day. It's the Cedar sinai tennis tournament and Bridget's murder mystery party. But that is wrong. It does not happen on the same day. Mm-hmm. The murder mystery party already happened. The murder mystery party was on Thursday, which was September 22nd, because like I said, we cannot interfere with Hef's schedule at all. And since it was a dinner and nighttime event, Friday, Saturday and Sundays all have buffet dinners and movies and we can't. Yeah. move those so it had to be on thursday september 22nd my actual birthday was the day of the tennis tournament which is sunday september 25th and then we see the people coming to set up the party and i love the shot of the lady walking around with like a limp dummy oh, in her yeah. arms it's a so body funny yeah <laughs> dead body and when they're setting up and planting the clues we also see a shot of the elusive phone room Yes, yes. Different angle on the secret phone room. Mm hmm. Because they put, uh, well, we can get into it when we go to the thing, but they put clues everywhere in mm-hmm. a lot of spots that you don't normally go to, too. So, like, even down in the wine cellar, which unfortunately I, I didn't see them show it in here. Yeah, there used to be a rule where they would not allow the wine cellar to be shown any time on TV, whether it was for Girls Next Door or when we were giving tours to media. It was a rule. And I don't know why that was. I think it was a security issue or they wanted to be able to use it as a panic room and they didn't want people to know where it was. But later on, I saw Crystal give a tour where she did the wine cellar. So I think somewhere along the line, like something fell through the cracks because it was a strong rule when we were there that the wine cellar was not supposed to be shown on camera. And I truly, I know there's going to be conspiracy theorists out there who like think (laughs) It's a trafficking thing or something. I sincerely don't think it was. I think it was just the fact that they had security reasons for that. They wanted it to be able to be used as a panic room if they needed to for some reason. Well, if you go down there, you would know that it didn't really lead to anything. It was very small. Like one or two people could fit down there at most at one time. It was a steep staircase that went down and it was a tiny little wine cellar. There was like a little table you could sit at that no one ever sat at. And it didn't go anywhere. Like there was no 
exit from down there. And the reason it existed is because that house was built in 1927 during Prohibition. So people need to have their own little secret place to stock alcohol. Right. That the cops wouldn't find. And it was very secret. Like in order to open the door, you had to find this little button that was hidden in the wood molding. You had to really know where it was. Yeah. And I think maybe another reason they didn't want it televised is maybe they didn't want party guests figuring out where it was. Oh, maybe. Like people who came up. Because that area was open to party guests, the living room and the library, if they knew where to go. Most people didn't go in there, but yeah, it was usually pretty sparsely populated. Yeah, you would not know it existed at all. It blended perfectly with the wood paneling. So you had to look for that little button and then it would pop open. And then you're like, okay, now I'm down here. Yeah, it's not super uncommon for like larger houses in LA that were built in the 20s to have these quote unquote wine cellars in the basement. Like yeah. one of the houses Pasquale and I lived in for a while had a wine cellar in the basement because it was built in 1926. But it's like, that's their prohibition hiding room. Right. <laughs> and do you remember some of the, one of, at least one of the stairs, maybe more, had like a fake thing and you could open it up and store things in there? Yeah, like the fake stair step yeah yeah that was so cool I know I love stuff like that so there was a lot of setup like I know they show them kind of coming the day of and setting things up but like I did a lot of things beforehand like I went through and I took pictures of everything in the house like all the different rooms because the idea I had for the invitation was to make my own clue board but using instead of like the actual clue rooms putting rooms of the mansion on there is what I wanted Mm -hmm. to do So I went around and I was snapping pictures of the dining room and the great hall and doing all these things, which also I should talk about. This is kind of a side note. But when I got those pictures, this was on a regular camera, you guys. And so when I took the film to be developed and I got them back, this is that photo where I got all of those crazy orbs yeah. in the picture and I know as you should post that on Patreon I, I will mm-hmm. and I know that um, orbs are super controversial in the paranormal world and these are not the orbs that you're thinking of that you would normally see in like a photo where somebody's like oh look orbs it's a ghost this was like it looked like the moon <gasps> it was huge the moon was inside the the mansion up by the chandelier. Damn. And it was so crazy and so huge that I actually went back to the professional camera place and I asked them, what is this in my photos? And they got out the negatives and they were looking through a loop and they were like, I cannot explain it. Wow. So I, that's one of my like, paranormal I put that in quotes photos because I can't explain it and I everybody that I've interviewed that like that researches the evidence for paranormal stuff like that I've showed it to them and nobody has like an answer for me you have to post it and people can weigh in yeah you guys tell me what you think it is I'm not saying it's paranormal but I just cannot figure out what it is I'm saying it's paranormal. I would like to say it's paranormal, but like, you know. Also, so, okay, I made my own invitations and the pictures didn't end up working on the thing, but I randomly found the these papers they were actually for scrapbook pages but it was the clue board and so in the center of it I like burned parchment paper and printed out the invitation on there and I glued it into the middle of the clue boards and then I got these like manila folders and I put confidential like top secret stamps on it and then I addressed them to everybody and sent them all out so that was really fun I do that for my son now because he's been into pirates for so long so he'll draw a pirate map and he's like mom can you burn the edges I love and he gets doing really it. excited I yeah, know it's, it's like one fun. of my favorite things it, if you're gonna do that it's good to have like some water or like a wet or rag do it over nearby. a sink yeah or you, yeah do it because you want to you want to burn it only so far and it'll get like carried away really quickly so you have to like be able to tap it out when you're mm-hmm. when you want it to in, just in case anyone wants to try it fire a, safety kids it's a fun project though and then the guest list was a whole thing like I had to be very particular on the guest list like they had to know exactly who was going to be there were you allowed to invite whoever you wanted so I had to be very specific on the guest list like there could only be like 25 people because any more than that and it gets like kind of crazy uh-huh. and they had to know details about every single person that was going to be there and yes I was allowed to bring some people but I wasn't allowed to like invite everybody I would have invited if I had the party back home like I can't invite my whole family or like everybody but I was able to invite my mom and my sister and my best friend from high school which is kind of crazy Lisa right yeah Lisa and so they came I don't think that I'm for some reason I didn't my stepdad wasn't there and I don't know if there was a reason he didn't come or if I didn't feel like I could invite him or I don't know what what or if he just thought oh it's a girl's thing you guys just have fun but then 
everybody had a part. So everybody, the other thing I had to do was give this acting troupe like personal information on each person. So I would like be like, oh, this is Rich and he's married to Beth and he used to do this for a living and now he does this and he drives this and they have, you know, this dog or whatever. Like I had to give personal information so they could use it as clues against each other. So, and then they don't show me getting my dress made, which I thought was amazing. I go to Trashy and have that gown made. They did a great job on that dress. Oh, I went back to Trashy yesterday with Ashley. How was it? It was so much fun. Edie was there and she started our Halloween. We did the basis of our Halloween costumes we're going to do this year because yes, it's June, but I'm already working on that. (laughs) And they have so many dogs in there. It's amazing. They have like a big St. Bernard and like all these cute dogs. And then the crazy thing is the owner's son was there who is now 17 and I remember so clearly when he was born (gasps) and like the mom would like bring the baby in and I'm like oh my god time flies yeah so in commentary here you and I are talking about how much we love the game Clue and like how long we've been playing it and that kind of stuff which by the way we just played it this last weekend I know we were at the Haunted Mansion themed Airbnb down in Orange County and we played Haunted Mansion Clue and it was so much fun you guys we had a slumber party with Bob Gurr and if you don't know who Bob Gurr is he's like a Disney legend I made a TikTok about it and when I make content I try to like kind of crop people out of it a little bit because I don't want to like you know how it is when somebody catches you on camera and you're like oh bitch I look like shit take that down you know what I mean so unless I ask somebody beforehand I'm kind of like cropping people out so I got your ghost backpack and I mentioned you but you're not actually in it and Bob Gurr is like barely in it you can kind of see him but I mentioned who he was and everybody in the comments is like oh casual Bob Gurr because <laughs> if you're a Disney fan you know who he is yeah so he invented basically almost everything that moves at Disneyland yeah. I think that's what they say about him like the monorail the fire truck truck the doom buggies all that kind of stuff and so that was he's like 92 I think he said yeah he was at my wedding too he drove me around in a steam car a oh he's the talk one. about vintage cars he drove me around in a steam car from Main Street USA and it was so fun yeah that's so cool I didn't I realize he was the one that drove you around yeah how amazing is that Yeah, so this just like, it was like kind of serendipitous how this whole thing came about, but um, but we taught him how to play Haunted Mansion, Disney Clue. Mm -hmm. So fun. (laughs) He'd never played Clue before. So um, we taught him that and he taught me all about the Doom Buggy. I love it. (laughs) Fair exchange. And that house is incredible. And if you don't know what we're talking about, you should totally look it up on Airbnb because it is so cool. Or look at Holly's TikTok. (laughs) (laughs) I forgot how big this tennis tournament was. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. It takes up the whole front lawn. Mm -hmm. I know it didn't go in the backyard at all because I know we still did fun in the sun when it was going on, but it took up the entire front lawn, which is huge, if you guys don't remember. And then um, there were like almost... I don't know if it was like really bleachers, but almost like bleacher seating all around the whole edge of the tennis court. So that's a big area. And the purpose of the tennis tournament was to raise money to find a cure for diabetes. Are we still working on that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we only have treatments, right? Right. There's no such thing as a cure yet. I wish there was a cure. I know so many people that suffer from that. So bring back that tennis tournament, y'all. And so right away in commentary, I say um, how bummed I was because I wanted to play in this tournament. Which I didn't know the whole story behind because I don't think, because you had your family in town and were busy planning the party. So I don't think you and I were checking in with each other as much as usual. Mm -hmm. So I remember you telling me about how you had wanted to do the tennis tournament and were told no. And the reason you were told no was because it was quote unquote Kendra's thing. And that was all I kind of heard about it. And you told me that after the fact. So I had always assumed that Kevin had told you no. No. So tell us the real story. So it starts actually the year before. So the year before, Kendra wants to play in the tournament and they're looking for somebody to do it with her. And I mean, I don't know how to play. I I can bat the ball back and forth, but I don't actually know how to professionally play tennis. So I didn't volunteer myself and they were desperately looking for somebody, couldn't find anybody. And... I didn't know what to expect because I'd never seen the like celebrity mm-hmm. tournament thing before. And so actually Crystal, 
Camden, uh, got one of her friends to play with Kendra. And we went out and we watched. And I was like, oh, they were just like sort of being goofy and silly and batting uh-huh. the ball back and forth, like something I could have totally done. And I was like, oh, if I would have known it was that, I totally would have done it with her. Mm-hmm. And I remember thinking, next year, I'll, I'll tell her I'll do it with her. So then this year rolls around. And it just, like I mentioned before, just happens to be on my birthday. And I thought, that'd be kind of fun. Like, since we're doing my birthday on the 22nd, like on the 25th actual birthday, like do this tennis tournament. It's something kind of out of my element, but I like pushing Mm -hmm. myself to things like that. And it's just kind of fun and tongue in cheek. It's not like this serious thing or anything. So I'll volunteer to do it with her because they were looking, again, they were looking for somebody to do it with her. So I went in and told Mary that I want to do the tennis tournament with Kendra this year. And I was all excited about it. And Mary kind of looked at me and she was like, why? And I was like, because I think it would be fun fun I mean and it falls on my birthday I thought that would be a fun thing to do and she was like hmm let me think about that and get back to you like why is she the gatekeeper of that though yeah well she wanted to talk to Kendra about it first and then she came back in and said Kendra doesn't want you doing it she says it's her thing wait why is Kendra the gatekeeper of the tennis tournament I don't know, but it was Kendra's thing and I wasn't allowed to be a part of it. And I was really disappointed in that because if it were something that I was doing and Kendra wanted to do it, I guarantee you they wouldn't be like, well, Bridget doesn't want you to do that because it's kind of her thing. No, they would force you to include her. Yeah. And not only that, but they would berate you for not thinking of it first. Yes, absolutely. So I get sports is more kind of Kendra's thing, but this is like just tapping the ball back and forth and being silly about it. It's not like it's it's not like we're having a real tennis tournament here. Yeah, it makes no sense to me. So I was kind of bummed and I say it to her in commentary because I know we never really talked about it. Mm-hmm. Like I know I did not confront her about it and be like, what do you mean you, I can't be a part of this? I just like let it go. I mean, I was very hurt by it, but I so I didn't let it go in my mind, but I let it go as far as not saying anything to her about it. But when we're doing this commentary, which is quite a bit later I say oh I was so bummed because I wanted to play with you in it and she's just silent and she kind of makes this like weird grunting noise like yeah "Uh." uh, noise so then they show the tennis tournament obviously it's clear by the amount of people there that there's no way that we're doing both of these events in the same day like I Mm -hmm. mentioned before and then in voiceover it has you talking about the event and I totally forgot that Monty Hall was like the guy that like puts it on I don't know who Monty Hall is okay good then I I wrote it (laughs) he's the host of this whole thing and for those that don't know he used to be the host of a game show called Let's Make a Deal and I used to love that show because everyone had to come dressed in costumes to it oh I've seen that well it's on now but somebody it's there's a different yeah. host now but he did it for the longest time when I was growing up he was the host oh, okay so that's all I know him from I'm sure he did uh-huh. other things too but that's what I know him from but if you've never seen let's make a deal everyone has to show up wearing costumes and they always like really I mean they really did a good job on oh, it I thought that's fine. at least back in the day yeah. they did speaking of costumes can we talk about the clown guy before I forget oh my gosh tell them about why we we <laughs> who this even is so there was this well I don't know who he is really but there was a guy dressed as a clown like a professional clown who would come to this tennis tournament every year and as we know clowns are a little bit eerie and he gave you a doll of himself yes you guys it's like a puppet doll you can see it in your room I forget what episode but I know there's an episode where I can see it hanging on your wall in your room and it's a replica of him yeah it's exactly him it's his makeup and he used to hand out business cards I used to have saying that he was in the movie The Doors and I love that movie so I was thinking like what was he in The Doors and I looked it up and there's a scene near the end where Jim Morrison goes to a kid's birthday party and he's the clown at that birthday party oh oh that's funny but yeah it was we'll have to find a picture of him and put it up because he was an interesting cat yeah totally (laughs) oh we have we have pictures with him for sure But I don't think we have them for this year. No, it had to have been the year before because the Mm -hmm. picture I'm thinking of, you were in the picture. Yeah. So this, by the way, this not allowing me to do things with Kendra because it's her thing. This is just the first time, but this is going to come up again in the future. And it was really frustrating for me because I, I'm not like Miss Athletic or anything like that, but I enjoy doing athletic things. Well, you are the most athletic at some things. Like there are some things we go do later on in episodes that you are the best at by far. Yeah. And I, I enjoy doing those things. Like when we go surfing later and I always went on hikes at this point in time, I liked hitting 
swinging the ball back and forth. In fact, she always wanted somebody to go out there and do it with her. And I always volunteered and she'd always be like, mm, like she didn't want to do it with me. But she can borrow your tennis outfit for this, right? She did. <laughs> she did. Because I had this really cute little tennis outfit. She wears it in the, not when she's actually doing the tournament, she wears it to go do practices. So then it cuts to Kendra. She's talking to Bryant about how her and Destiny are going to be playing against each other. By the way, Destiny didn't even want to do it. Kendra forced Destiny to do it with her so she had somebody to play with. When you were right there wanting to do it the whole time. Exactly. So what do you think is behind this? Because we've got to get into this. Like I promised everybody, you know, why there was tension. Yeah, I I wish I knew. I really think that she just was so competitive and couldn't, didn't want to be tight with us. She didn't want us to be included in her thing. She wanted to always stand apart. Yeah, that was what would go wrong for me. Like when there were flare ups, it was because there was this really aggressive energy she had sometimes where she had to be really, really competitive. And it was frustrating because this was our entire life. It's not like you have a coworker who's kind of annoying or somebody in your friend group who's always trying to get at you or something. It's like at the mansion, we lived in such a contained bubble that that was our home life, our work life, our love life, and our social life. Mm-hmm. Like everything was there. So when you had to put up with something annoying or like a hostile energy, you had to deal with it 24 7. But it was a really weird, hostile energy coming from her, considering the fact that we had done nothing but try to be welcoming. Yeah. And I don't know where that was coming from. The only thing I can attribute it to is I know when you're at the mansion, for some reason, we all want to think of Hef as the hero. And I think we kind of want to think that because it justifies the decision we made to be part of such an unconventional relationship that everyone's judging us for you want to be like well Hef's a great guy Hef's a great guy it makes you feel better about your decision at least that's from my experience what I can relate to and it's very much easier to look at the other girls and be like if I'm feeling stifled here or if I'm feeling controlled or if I'm feeling unhappy it's the other girl's fault and when you look at like the mean girls era yeah there were a lot of really mean girls Mm -hmm. but it was also you know from my end it was me putting all the blame on the other women and just totally being like rose colored glasses when it comes to Hef. So maybe she had a little bit of that going on where she wants to think of Hef as the hero. So if she was ever feeling stifled or unhappy or like she couldn't express herself due to the mansion rules, that anger instead got bounced onto us because I felt that energy so hard from her. Mm -hmm. But it made me feel like shit and it was just something you couldn't really get away from because we were so contained in that bubble. Yeah, well, there's two things that I was thinking too. One is that Kendra doesn't like it if she's not the center of the attention if somebody else is. And this doesn't just happen with me or you. It also happens with playmates in the future yeah. we're going to see. So this is going to come up multiple times. So, But also the part that gets me too, in this type of situation that we're in here, we have to be team players. Exactly. And I'm all about being a team player. And you would think with her sports background, she would be about being a team player, but she is absolutely not. She doesn't want to be a team player at all. She always wants it to be Kendra does this and they do that. Yeah. And like I said, it's all about being a team player in this type of thing. Like we're not saying we all have to be exactly the same, but can we all just be on the same team and get along? Like, can we root for each other and be there for each other when it's your moment in the spotlight? Yeah. And we knew we had to do that because we had gone through hell with all those other women before. And uh, some of these seeds were planted back in the Lodi episode because Again, that episode was my episode Uh and about me and she doesn't like it. So she like puts little snarky things in there, which I just let slide. And then this episode happens and things get a little worse. And then they're going to escalate after this, too, in the next season. Yeah. Yeah, there's definitely it's definitely a cycle like it changes from season to season. And there would become a time later when we did all get along after that. But at the end of season one and then in season two, you can see the tension in a lot of different episodes. Yeah, and it really builds in this one. And then like like we said earlier, a couple weeks later, we go off to New York and Chicago and I 100% have her back and we're getting along and we're like, you know, hanging out together and dancing and having a good time. But it's because I have to just let those things go. Yeah, we know we have to because we know how bad things get when you don't. Right. And I know she's never going to be like, oh, sorry. Sorry, I didn't want you to play in that. But it's just, it's my thing. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so then we're in a scene and there we're in the butler's pantry and Kendra's trying to wash off the paint because this is the day you guys were actually doing those tombstones outside. Yeah, it was directly after that. Which is interesting because you could just see it just gives you an example of how out of order everything is mm-hmm. shot in here. She says, How do you get p- black paint off your hands? And Bryant says, Paint thinner. And she's pretending to wipe it off, but like it's stuck on her hands. And then she pretends to wipe it on Bryant's white shirt. This he is says, like a theme. It reminds me of the whipped cream scene. It's exactly that scene. And he says, or, and you can tell he's not amused. And he says, or you wipe it on me. And he says it very, you know, plainly. And I think that she must have gotten some flack for this scene because in commentary, she's super defensive of it. And she's like, I was just fucking around and that paint was totally dry. You guys can lay off me or something like that. Like, she's just like... I'm curious where she got that feedback. It must have been from the internet because like you and I would have never said anything. No way. And... I don't think Hef would have said anything. And that kind of scene was Kevin's sense of humor and what he loved. It's like those just slapstick, like physical gags, like a pie in the face. It's the equivalent of a pie in the face. Like when you're yeah. squirt whipped cream on somebody and Kevin's just like rolling, laughing, thinking it's comedy gold. <laughs> but see, I don't think that that's funny for a different reason. Like maybe if that were her and Destiny doing it to each mm-hmm. other. But I feel like it's not equal when you're doing it to somebody who's hired there to work. Oh, for sure. Like, you're not on the same playing field, and that's not fair. It's dehumanizing. Yes, 100%. And so these scenes just really make me cringe. And I know they think it's so funny and so cute. I do not. I do not. And I I feel Bryant's disamusement with it. (laughs) Yeah, and age isn't an excuse either. Like, no other 18-year-old playmate would have been in there doing that. No, but I'm so tired of hearing that excuse from everybody. Yeah, there were a lot of other women in our community who were her age and younger and didn't act like that. Yeah, including my sister, who was way younger, so... Okay, so Kendra's talking about how important it is to stretch before a game. It's like in her room, and she's talking about how important it is to stretch before a game, and it shows her changing. Well, this is the beginning of a trope because there's plenty of um, scenes coming up within the first couple seasons of this show where they'll do full cold opens of just scenes of Kendra changing in her room and stretching and doing booty dances in front of the mirror. And I always wondered how those came about, like, because she was at times like not wanting to get out of bed or not wanting to come out of her room for scenes. So I don't know if it was the kind of thing where like the crew felt like they had to just invade her room to get her to get up. Or was it something she wanted to do? Like, oh, I'm going to change and dance in front of the camera. I don't know what it was, but it was something that repeated a lot. Yeah. Like you see it several cold opens on the show and it's just I feel like it's you know the show trying to get like as much sexuality as possible and it's just kind of and it shows her dogs barking like crazy but if you listen again those are your dogs that's They're funny. not her dogs making that noise rascal's funny when he jumps on her back the corgi I know did you know that Fergie inherited Queen Elizabeth's corgis no I thought they went to a family member yeah Fergie she was her daughter-in-law. Oh, not, not Fergie, Fergie the, the singer. singer. No. Oh. <laughs> That's a funny image, though. I was watching a TikTok where they were talking about Fergie inheriting the corgis, and the person commenting was kind of like, oh, you know, she's doing a whole press tour with these corgis. But I'm sorry if I inherited the queen's corgis. It would be my full only personality trait for like several years <laughs> there would be pop walks with these dogs there'd be photo shoots my kids would be throwing the dogs tea parties absolutely it would be a full life that's so funny so Hef's sitting outside and this guy named Steve Powers comes up and says hello boss and he's going to introduce him to the two pro tennis players that Kendra and Destiny are going to be playing against but I was wondering like I, when I was watching this I was like I remember Steve Powers coming to the mansion like all the time and stuff. Mm -hmm. But in my head, I'm like, who is Steve Powers, though? Like, who was he? Oh, I can tell you. Yes. But before we say that, I just want to mention that Hef's watching people practice at a neighbor's tennis court. That's why you see a white house up on the hill. That house was across the street, like the same street as the Playmate house. That's why it has that sloping property. That was my next question. Who is Steve Powers and where is Hef? Yeah. (laughs) Because this isn't the mansion. And I have a vague memory 
that every year they would practice over there. Like that yeah. neighbor was always very kind and like lending her tennis court, which I don't know why they weren't just practicing at the mansion. Maybe they needed to for some reason. But I remember it was like an annual thing where they would use that neighbor's tennis court for I the th- practice. I think it was like a warm up area. It was right across the street. So you could go over and warm up and then come over. Oh, so it was during the t- kind of the same day. I think so. Okay, yeah, it's that- the same exact day. Totally makes sense. So Steve Powers was this older man who was a regular at the mansion. And I remember when I first met him, he used to wear this hot pink Spice Girls hat. (laughs) So that's the first thing I always think of is the Spice Girls hat. But it was one of those guys that you didn't really know what he did or like, quote unquote, who he was. I think he's described as a 78 year old investor and developer and he was always very nice to me. Oh, always I nice to me I thought he had too. a nice personality. I liked him. I always thought he was super nice, but he was always very soft-spoken and professional and like just nice and friendly. So yeah, that's how I know him. And like just, just this older man. And I always had the feeling he did like real estate of some sort, but I never know why I even thought that. But yeah, something yeah. to do with that. The first thing I heard about Steve was in the 70s, he used to drive around in this vintage Rolls Royce. He used to drive it up and down Sunset Boulevard with a huge bullhorn. And anytime he would see attractive young women, he would honk the bullhorn what? at these women and pull over and be like, hey, do you want to go to the Playboy Mansion? Get. And they'd jump in his car. Oh my God. Yeah. The whole driving up and down Sunset Boulevard thing reminded me of Pig Night. What is pig night? Pig night was this thing they used to do back in the 70s. It was like a weekly thing. You know how I've had his weekly schedule. There's a period of time where this would be, I don't know, Thursdays or something. And they would have somebody go up and down Sunset Boulevard, pick up sex workers off the street, bring a bunch of them to the mansion. They'd sit down, have dinner. A bunch of Hef's friends would be there. Hef would come down to it. And Hef's doctor allegedly would take each woman one by one off to the Great Hall bathroom and quote unquote examine them for STDs, which is crazy to me because you can't tell by looking if someone has an STD necessarily. You need to send shit back to the lab. So I don't know if he was like looking for open sores or inflammation or what he was looking for. But they had to go through that. I'm already horrified. Yeah. And then the guys would have sex with these women. They called it pig night. Wow. So there was that. And do we know this for sure happened? I mean, I can't vouch for it. I wasn't there. But this is according to Secrets of Playboy and the book Dark Secrets of Playboy. Hef is sitting outside. He says, hello, boss. I'd like to, you to meet Luke and Murphy Jensen. Luke Jensen is an American former professional tennis player and Grand Slam doubles champion. Jensen won the 1993 French Open doubles title with his younger brother, Murphy Jensen. That's who Kendra and Destiny are going to be playing doubles mm-hmm. with. So now we're back to the tournament. Like I said, every celebrity is teamed up with a pro. So Kendra and Destiny are teamed up with the Jensen brothers. And I think other people were playing throughout the day, too. This isn't the only thing. It's just the only thing the show shows for obvious reasons. And um, they ask Hef, are we going to see some playmates out on the tennis circuit? And Hef said, well, he doesn't pick his girlfriends based on their tennis skills, which I thought was funny. Yeah. Then they are telling Ray Anthony that Kendra is the ringer. And Ray says, well, she hits the balls back and forth. She, no, he says, Ray says, well, she's hit the balls back and forth before. Because Ray was a pretty good tennis player, right? Yeah. And you know what I noticed is he is dressed to the nines. And I'm thinking, why would that be? But I think he was dressed up so nicely because every year at the tennis tournament, he would like play trumpet a little bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. But I was when I first watched this, I'd forgotten that. And I was like, Ray Anthony is really dressed up. Well, and just so you guys know, Keith and Ray Anthony and Steve Powers and a few other people would regularly use the tennis court all the time. Mm -hmm. Are you surprised that Hef walked across the street for this practice session? Well, he did it just for the cameras. Yeah. So I thought that, that's a lot of effort on it his is. behalf. But it was the show. He wouldn't have just gone yeah. over there for no reason. I mean, just because. Oh, okay. This is what I thought was really crazy. Uh-huh. Kendra is openly talking about in her interview how excited she is to play with two hot guys. And I was like blown away. And I remember being blown away at the time, too, because I could never have said that. And you 100% could not have said that. Yeah, it's interesting. It even reminds me of episode five, Fight Night, when it shows Kendra like 
gallivanting around dying to meet all these celebrities, I was kind of surprised, like, oh, I'm surprised Hef left that in there because it looks like she's so much more interested in any other guy there than Hef. They also wrote it off, and so did a lot of listeners, wrote it or w- viewers of the show wrote it off as, oh, she's just really excited to meet celebrities and athletes. Yeah, I can see that. That's what people write it off as. And I think that's what Hef wrote it off as and what the show is trying to pretend that, well, we know it's more than that, but like... We'll say it's that. Yeah, but it is interesting that they let her go so hard on the Jensen brothers. Later on, like in seasons down the road, when we do Loveline, I say that I thought Dr. Drew was cute. But I'm kind of like, like I do think he's a very handsome guy, but I'm kind of joking because he also has gray hair. So it's like fitting in with like the trope or like the joke. And I think everybody kind of knew that. So like nobody was weirded out about it. Yeah. But I do think it's odd that they're going with that and keeping that in the cut that Kendra thinks these guys who are like youngish and desirable are like really hot. Yeah. Um, So then it has Kendra talking about how nervous Destiny is. And can I just say for a minute that she should be? Because Kendra makes her feel really bad about the way she's playing and the way she's doing things. Mm -hmm. And I would be nervous for Destiny too. She doesn't play tennis. She doesn't want to play this thing. She's being forced to. There's hundreds of people around. The cameras are filming it. She's playing with two you know, champion Uh tennis players and she doesn't even want to be there. Yeah. (laughs) So like, I would be nervous too if I were that person. Um, And she's like putting uh, Destiny down, like her, her tennis abilities and things like that. But then... Kendra's the one who chokes in this whole thing. Yeah, they end up like playing it more for comedy and then she's like mad. And Yeah, it's well, just... it was never a serious event to begin yeah. with. Yeah. I mean, the year before, like I was saying, Kendra played with a random girl and they were out there like shaking their asses, like stopping and doing booty dances yeah. and like all kinds of stuff. And I thought, and I remember thinking, oh, well, if it's tongue, not that I want to be out there shaking my butt like that, but I was thinking, oh, if it's tongue in cheek and silly like this, yeah. I thought Why like not? it was going to be like, pop everybody's quiet Woo. one yeah. love Wimbledon Woo. yeah like I was like scared of it but then when I saw what it was the year before I was like oh I could do that I'll I'll do that with her next year but no I'm not I'm not good enough to do that do you know what I noticed that I don't think we've seen on the show before is the giant satellite dishes in the background oh yeah so right next to the tennis courts there was this area it was a pretty big area mm-hmm. where there were like three gigantic satellite dishes and when we gave tours of the mansion our bit was kind of like oh this is how we contact mars yeah because it was just so ridiculous to have these gigantic satellite dishes but the reason he had them is he was one of the first people to get like cable tv back when that was new and you needed that giant satellite dish for cable tv in like 70 something you know why else they had them too to go live from the mansion Oh, we were able like to different. do live events because of those big satellites. There was an actual like booth, like a room, like a. a I remember the control room booth. You would kind of like climb down underneath one of the satellite dishes. It was like climbing into like a rocket to space. Yeah, but it was like a broadcasting booth in there. How late did they use those? Like, were they still using those when we were there? Or was it something that they used to go live in, like, the 80s? Well, it was my uh, thoughts. I thought that they were going live with them for this tennis tournament for things. And they were also going live with it for, like, the fight nights and things like that. Like, they used stuff in there. I don't know how much the satellite itself, but they were definitely using equipment underneath there to go live. That's interesting, because I remember for a while I was kind of lobbying Hef to get rid of those and turn it into something else. And he never said anything like, oh, no we need those he just kind of grumbled like he didn't want to move anything (laughs) well I think that there's trucks that you can bring in that have all that stuff Mm -hmm. in it so you don't have to have that anymore to go live for events but I felt like they were still using them for for big things like that well that would make sense because I thought it was really weird that they still had those because they looked silly and they took up a lot of room like you could have built something back there a greenhouse to feed the nation or something there was three of them too i think yeah there was i wonder what the new owner has done with that area oh i think he's ripped that all out for sure so curious by the way if you guys want to know what happened to hef's car the new owner of the mansion has that too i think i'm at least assuming he does because i've seen a picture of him standing in front of it no i was straight up told he bought it yeah he bought the car separately 
Um, and as you can see, the tennis tournament is going off, and you can see it just turns into a straight comedy routine. The the pro guy is like stepping over the net to hit the ball on, from both sides, mm. and Destiny's screaming over and or, over again. I don't know what to do. What do I do? What do I do? Yeah. What do I do? At one point, the pros are st- are on their knees playing back and forth. Mm-hmm. Like it just turns like very. They even say in the show like very globe trotter style. So they play this off like you're getting ready for the party, but that couldn't have been where you really were. That's what I was just going to say. So I am not getting ready for the party because the party was on Thursday. So Mm -hmm. this is Sunday. And what happened was my birthday was on Thursday. We did the party that night and my mom and sister stayed in town for Friday and Saturday. And then Sunday was my actual birthday and my mom and sister were there. So on Sunday morning, I got ready for the tennis tournament like usual. I remember I was wearing my cute ass tennis outfit, the one I'd let Kendra borrow. And I got all dressed up. I had my hair in a ponytail, like was all ready to go. And when I went downstairs to meet, I found out that you guys had left without me. I feel so bad. We were texting about that, you guys, because when we watch that, sometimes we'll touch base on things before we actually record just to like figure stuff out. But I feel so bad. But I think we were waiting for you because I went back and looked, not waiting for you in the Great Hall, obviously, but when I look at my scrapbooks, for a while anyway, there was a seat next to Hef that was empty. Like eventually this other playmate, Tamara, that was with us sat in that seat. That's what you see on camera in the show. But for a while, when we were like taking pictures down there, there was a seat empty. And I was trying to remember what happened that day or like what, was going on and the odd thing is is I have no memory of that day at all and I know because of what I have in my scrapbook I have a ton of my own photos from that day in my scrapbook so I know I had my own camera and was taking pictures like crazy but I don't remember anything about that day which to me says I was either disassociating for some reason or I just had my mind on something else like maybe I was planning for the next upcoming event in my head or like making checking off my goal list in my head for whatever reason so I don't remember that day at all but if I had to make an educated guess on what happened I would say maybe Hef was really like grumpy and impatient that day and needed to get out there and just assumed maybe it was a fun in the sun-ish type thing that you would just wander out to but I don't remember anything about it maybe I don't know and maybe I was just emotional because it was my actual birthday Mm -hmm. that day and I um I just remember my mom was there so my mom can verify this story too I got all ready and she was like oh you're wearing the cutest tennis outfit and you were all ready and I went downstairs to meet up with everyone and no one no one was to be found and I was already very hurt over the fact that I wasn't allowed to play in this but even though I was hurt and I you know part of me was like I don't even want to go down there I was definitely going to go down there and Uh be supportive because that's what I do and who I am and I'm not going to like be that person and I went down there and you guys had left without me and I mean I was crushed like they told me that you guys left so bad I went back upstairs to my room I was like hysterical to my mom I feel so bad I had no idea (laughs) like I felt like even though I just had the most amazing incredible birthday it like Mm -hmm. just ruined everything yeah well it's a double pile on because already you're feeling like wait why can't I do the tennis tournament too and then you go to and like everybody's gone it's like what's going on it gives you that feeling of like wait what the fuck is going on does everybody hate me like what the fuck yeah and I remember I just changed my clothes and I said let's go and I got in my car and I just fucking left yeah I was like too bad and I remember driving past the tennis courts on the opposite side like uh, on the street and flipping (laughs) off the tennis courts nobody could see me because there's a big hedge and stuff but I was just like as I drove by I was so mad I was crying my mom was like what's happening oh no I was so upset by it so upset by it so in the last scene of this episode which obviously we'll get to at the last scene but I'm like bawling and devastated and it's just because there was so many emotions going Mm -hmm. on in my head like I just there was so much going on and it looks like I'm just emotional over my birthday but that's not what's happening here there's so much happening yeah well there's a lot and it's all kind of built on the foundation of the situation was structured in a strange way that wasn't fair and I feel like another reason it was so frustrating to have to deal with like Kendra's animosity is you know we'd been living there with the mean girls for so long and had to like kind of take shit from them and kind of like be small because of them and not live our fullest best lives and then things change and they get a lot better but I'm still taking a lot of shit from Hef and being small and not living my biggest best life and then we kind of have to take shit 
in a small way from this other person too that we don't deserve for no reason and we know we can't speak out about it or do anything because Heff will throw a fit and it'll throw off the whole equilibrium and we're just struggling to keep everything as nice and as good as possible. But that's a lot of shit we're burying. Yeah. Well, and I also have to say too, if my family, if my mom and sister hadn't been in town, I would have never been able to get away with just leaving the property like that. Yeah. And the other thing that strikes me about this too is that Hef never like just left without people unless like they were deliberately not going to come or something Mm -hmm. like that. So it's very weird for me. Like if Kendra, and I know I wasn't late, but let's just say I was late. Like if Kendra had been late, Hef would go upstairs and knock on our door and be like, let's go. What are you doing? Come on. But nobody came looking for me. Nobody was like, I must have had some sort of time in my head of when we were going to go because Mm -hmm. I went down at a certain time already. And so the fact that nobody even like called up to my room or came looking or was like, where is she? They just, everybody just left without me. Yeah, it's weird. And I was wondering too, like, did Hef think of it as such a casual thing, like a fun in the sun type thing? Like you'll come down when you'll come down. Cause I don't have any kind of like lineup picture of us before we leave or anything, but I can also see in the photos that I mic'd. Yeah. Even though I don't say a word in the scene, I mic'd. So obviously the cameras are there and I just feel like he must've just felt like grumpy and rushed for some reason. Cause he would get like that sometimes. I really don't know. It's one of those memories that I put out of my head, too, mm-hmm. until I rewatched it. And then I remembered. Like, when I saw Clueless on that was coming up, I was like, oh, my God, my murder mystery birthday party. I'm so excited. And the murder mystery party, I am so excited about. And it was the best per- birthday party of my life. Seriously. And I'm going to get all into that, of course. Mm-hmm. But then I was like, oh, the tennis tournament. And then it slowly, like, it didn't even come crushing back to me. It was like it slowly started coming back to me. And I, and I remember being really hurt and upset and I remember not going and I was like, wait, what happened here? And then it like, then it comes flooding back and I was like, oh, I put all of this out of my head Mm -hmm. and I had to, I had to, to move on and like continue like doing the things that we do that you've already seen like New York and Chicago and moving forward and stuff. But like this, this was very hurtful to me. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I feel like I was a part of it. Oh, I don't want you to <laughs> feel bad. I didn't mean to be, but I feel bad. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have to touch on this because it comes up so many times and it's not just the cameras doing this. Like it shows Kendra talking up this big talk about how she's so good at every mm-hmm. little thing that she's going to do. Like whether it's the tennis tournament or later it's the surfing or like it's things we've already seen too and even like what we talked on last week about in Chicago with doing the man cow thing like she talks it up like she's gonna knock this out of the park because it's her thing it's her thing and stuff and it always oh and bowling was another example of it and yeah. stuff and then she doesn't do very well at it and I know the show like pays close attention to that and and pushes that extra but it's also true how it's happening yeah like she's not so perfect at all of these things but instead of taking just like admitting it or like laughing it off or whatever she gets super competitive she becomes like such a sore loser she gets really grumpy like in this scene they show her throwing her racket and it's clearly like a comedy routine going on Mm -hmm. they even add a laugh track to this can I tell you this was Kevin's favorite trait of Kendra's that she would talk herself up talk herself up and then not be good at something. yeah because during like the spinoff years when Kevin and I were closer and we would talk about a lot of things he would talk about how like say for girls next door season six like people at the network or whoever would be like okay well the twins are the new Kendra or Jade Nicole is like the Kendra of this because in the network's mind, Kendra was a party girl and that was her dominant trait. So if the twins were party girls, like they were the new Kendra. And Kevin told me that he's like, they have Kendra all wrong. Like she's not a party girl. That's not the appeal. Kendra is a kitten trying to be a tiger. She talks a big game, like she's going to conquer all this shit. And then she doesn't like that was his favorite gag about Kendra. Mm. So I don't know. That was just like his sense of humor or like what he liked about her or what he thought was appealing. Yeah. 
But it's interesting that that gets played up a lot because that was his favorite trait. It gets it gets played up so much in this. Mm-hmm. But what I think is important to note too is that how upset she gets over it that she's a poor sport about all this stuff mm-hmm. because I think everybody thinks oh Kendra she's easygoing oh she's funny oh she's just silly and stuff but she's also very very competitive and very much a poor sport. Yeah, I think that competitiveness being the dominant trait was where a lot of the hostility we felt came from. It's just, I don't think we deserved it. And yeah. And again, it goes back to not being a team player. Mm -hmm. And that's not just with us. And this goes to show it's with everybody, even the pros Mm -hmm. and destiny. Like she just can't be a team player if things aren't going her way. Like she can't just have fun with it and take one for the team and be like, yeah, okay, we're just going to be silly with this. Like, yeah, let's not take it so seriously. No, she's got to like throw her racket and get pissed. And like Mm -hmm. when everybody else is clearly just trying to have a good time with it. Yeah. Which is, I feel like so such a good comparison to what happens with us too. Yeah, it's interesting the traits we have that like aren't well suited to being in this situation. Like that's Kendra's trait, and like my trait, I think, is being on the spectrum and like highly sensitive and not like I should not be in like a public house like that or in a place where I have no privacy or in a group situation. Did you feel like you had a part of your personality that didn't mesh well with being part of that group? I feel like for Kendra, she's too competitive. And for me, I'm too, I get overstimulated. Maybe I'm just oversensitive. Like I cry a lot in the the (laughs) whole thing. I cry at the end of this one. You even make fun of me for it at the end in commentary. (laughs) But I mean, maybe I'm just too oversensitive and like take things too personally, I think is probably my, I mean, what do you think? Do you think I, what? Um, I would love to hear what you think. (laughs) Well, I think you were handled being in that situation better than most people and were able to turn a lot of things into positives. Like, I don't think, um, like with my situation, it's a lot darker, but I, if I had to pick one thing, I would say maybe or maybe just like the Libra attention to fairness because things oh. weren't fair there. They were fr- like Hef always acted like he just wanted harmony and he just wanted things to be fair, but they were definitely not fair. And it wasn't that way with the three of us. It existed before that. It existed before me. Like it was supposedly yeah. like according to other people who were there, it was like that's how he would set it up. Yeah, a hundred percent. I was not cool with the unfairness. Like I've always need and uh, to this day. And Nick always tells me life's not fair. You got to quit focusing on the fairness I'm like no I need it to be yeah. fair so 100% that would be a downfall living there but I also feel like it's my emotional side too which I don't think is necessarily a bad thing like I'm I'm I I like I like my my emotional side well it's but. not a bad thing and you do have to give yourself some grace because it was a fucked up situation like no matter how many positives we did get out of it or no matter how much you can choose to only look at the good things like it was a fucked up situation it wasn't fair and we weren't treated like adults yeah and in the end I think that this episode and so many more and and the whole relationship with Kendra turns to me comes down to we have to be team players yeah and there was one person there that was not a team player yeah Okay, so we've been talking for a minute and next week we will have the murder mystery party to get into. And we're also going to talk about just some mysteries about the mansion and, you know, some urban legends and some things and some questions we have. And if we could have any questions about our time on the show answered, what would we want to know? And are we going to find out? I hope so. Yeah. So if you want more content, be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash girls next level. Yeah. And thank you so much for getting us to 16 million downloads. We love you guys. Yeah, we love you guys and appreciate it so much just how you're on this journey with us and having fun with us and even the comments you leave on our girls next level instagram like we love it so thank you